Muchas gracias a la MBA Sara Rogers por su conferencia. Soy el doctor Pedro Ponce, líder de la Unidad de Investigación de Tecnologías Habilitadoras para el Desarrollo de Materiales Avanzados del Institute of Advanced Materials for Sustainable Manufacturing. La percepción global sobre el impacto ambiental de CO2 emitido en los procesos de manufactura ha despertado el interés por desarrollo de tecnologías disruptivas que puedan mejorar la eficiencia de estos procesos. Estas tecnologías tendrán un gran impacto en la producción a través de la gestión de la energía disponible y la reducción de residuos. Por lo que estos procesos de manufactura aumentarán su eficiencia y su rentabilidad, siendo más amigables con el medio ambiente, reduciendo el uso de energía y las emisiones de CO2, teniendo como resultado el incremento de la competitividad de mercado en las pequeñas y medianas empresas manufactureras. El siguiente, perdón, el siguiente panel se titula Open Innovation and Strategic Collaboration. Participan la doctora Amina Robinson, vicepresidente de investigación e innovación de la Universidad de Alberta, que se encuentra por videoconferencia. Adam Hamilton, presidente y CEO de South Research Institute. El doctor Vladimir Bulovic, director MIT Nano del MIT. Y como moderador, el doctor Arturo Molina, director del Institute of Advanced Materials for Sustainable Manufacturing. Le paso la palabra al doctor Arturo Molina. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for keeping here in this Congress. Uh, I would like to thank you first, Amina, uh, uh, being here by uh, video conference. And hello, Amina. I hope that you are very well. Nice uh, say that. Uh, We're going to talk about open innovation and strategic collaboration among our institutions, but also I would like to thank you, uh, uh, Amina, Adam, and Vladimir, because they are also members of our research advisory board of the Institute. So we are going to keep working together very closely to try to achieve the objectives and, uh, and goals that uh, President David Garza and Guillermo Torre has Uh, ask us to do. So we have a lot of work to do, Amina, Adam, and, and Vladimir, not only myself, okay? So we are in this together. <laughs> so climate change and the challenge to achieve sustainability development are huge responsibility for academics and research institutes around the world. The complexity of the problems requires strategy, alignment, open innovation, and of course, strategic collaboration and sharing of human resources and talent and infrastructure. First, I would like to ask Amina, why is it important to share knowledge, research, and innovation between Canada, United States, and Mexico to achieve sustainable manufacturing in North America? Please, Amina, if you can answer that question. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, to this wonderful event, and it's such an honor to be here with you. I wish I could be there in person, but I very much had the pleasure of visiting Uh, your campus and your labs uh, in June, so it's really nice to be able to come back uh, even virtually. Um, so, you know, I'd like to start by saying I think that collaboration, whether it's across institutions or across disciplines, is is really critical in uh, in every aspect of what we do now. We know that we're facing global challenges, and certainly climate change is something that if we are to address it, we will need to do so collectively. Um, I, I do believe that in the in the case of sustainable manufacturing, we can embark on some pretty disruptive uh, technologies, and these will have long-lasting impacts on many of our economies. And in order to do so, I think there's uh, quite a few things that we can do collectively. Uh, the first thing is really get an understanding of what we mean by sustainable manufacturing. And uh, there's many different terms that that refer to the same thing, and we've heard uh, terms such as green manufacturing, but really getting an understanding of what it is that we mean, uh, including you know, fabrication processes, minimizing waste, and reducing environment, environmental impact of those processes. We're also, uh, we need to be cognizant of the circular economy and where advanced manufacturing fits within that. And there's so much in the circular economy that will be impacted um, by advanced manufacturing And that really is looking at our materials and processes by through the lens of reducing uh, reduction, reuse, and recycling. And then last but not least, I think the, the most important thing is that 
it enables us to share our knowledge, our outcomes and our innovations across North America. Um, you know, Canada, US and Mexico are partners in so many different ways. And by coming together in this way, we have a significant opportunity to make a much broader impact and really ensure that we are um, sharing and developing, implementing best practices and processes across our integrated materials and manufacturing value chains, making sure we identify and scale um, operations efficiently, but also really take advantage of our economies of scale to generate cost savings. And so I really look forward um, through this uh, you know, center to, to, to be able to contribute to those initiatives and others. And again, thank you again for this opportunity to join you. Thank you, Mina, for your answer. Uh, I would like to pass the word to Adam, please, if you tell me what is this important? The, the same question? Same question. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Molina. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and for all the effort you put into the relationship that we're rebuilding and to the work here at Monterey Tech. It's a fantastic organization, and I look forward to spending more time here in Monterey. So with regard to why should we share information amongst Canada, the United States, and Mexico, I, I think it's critically important because of what we're facing. Climate change is real. The causes of it, people may want to argue or deliberate, but things are changing. And we are the only species that can do anything about this. So we really have to use everything we can to try to solve problems that are contributing to this change. And I think the best way to do that is to share ideas because ideas create more ideas. Ideas can come from anyone. It doesn't even have to be a technical person necessarily, although I think the technical people probably have some advantage. But if we can share those ideas and share them amongst each other, we're able to very quickly identify those concepts, those ideas, and those potential solutions that could have real impact, real meaningful impact. So I, I think it's critical that we do share the ideas. It's sustainability is everyone's issue, everyone's problem, and so nobody should be able to capture ideas and not share them. Um, I think that would be something that would be counterproductive. I know there are people out there concerned about intellectual property rights and who owns the technology, but right now I think we need to focus on solving the problem and worry about intellectual property and uh, I guess commercialization of some of the technologies at a later date. So I, I think um, it's incumbent upon all of us that are involved in in academia, or in industry, or in government, or private citizens, to do what we can to contribute to solutions that will help us resolve climate change issues in particular. And this institute, the Sustainable Manufacturing Initiatives, are critical to that, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Vladimir, what do you think? <laughs> well, thank you very much for asking. Uh, and again, uh, it's an honor to be with you, um, truly. The, um, every environment is different, and all of our knowledge bases are different, and yet uh, we sometimes take for granted that you understand me really well. I don't necessarily do until I come and visit you. I didn't know that you had deer going through your yard here, for example. That's absolutely fascinating, but I'm sure there are plenty of other attributes of your knowledge and everyday experience that we can much better understand and much better understand how to connect to my own experience once we actually experience each other. Coming down to Monterey Tech, coming to MIT, going up to Canada and seeing a variety of environments. All of us already have adapted to a particular modality of our existence. And yet, by sharing those modalities, we have an opportunity really to enliven all of us come up with methodologies that I wouldn't necessarily know that are so easy to do, but you do. Um, I think the other thing to highlight is that, yes, the planet is changing and we need to do something about it. All of us um, might feel insignificant compared to the challenge at hand, meaning, oh my goodness, you know, should I stop consuming as much water? Should I stop driving my car as much? You know, when everyone else is gonna do opposite, right? So it seems that way. However, uh, the reason why things do change is because the culture changes, the movement changes. 
the sense of what's right and what's wrong changes. Um, because, and we are at a tipping point. We understand just by looking at the climate outside um, around us that we need to do something now. This is not one of those things that's on someone else. This is on us. Um, it's very hard to ask for sacrifices on, you know, you need to stop producing this particular material because it emits a lot of carbon. Well, don't tell me that. I still need that material. Give me a solution that replaces that material with an equivalent value and make sure I don't lose a job in a process. Make sure you can get me another way to provide for my family. Because at the end of the day, there are grand issues and then there are local cultural issues that I also need to address. For us to appreciate those other elements of the solution is more than reading science papers. <laughs> it's much more about being with each other, understanding each other's needs, and figuring out what together we might be able to accomplish. And hence, thanks for bringing us. Thank you for being here, really. Uh, uh, I, I hear a lot about uh, global knowledge to be applied to local problems. And I, I think that we think alike, you know? And, but that needs to and requires open innovation, the issue of open innovation, how we work together, how we work and pass these ideas of property, intellectual property rights and so on. So I would like to ask uh, how we should address the open innovation in order to do this type of work that we need to do, you know, to, to really discover new materials, achieve uh, sustainable manufacturing. Amina? Thank you. That's uh, such a great question, and I, I'm so glad that other speakers um, spoke to the intellectual property issue. Um, you know, th this this type of work requires a very interdisciplinary approach, and uh, the only way we're going to have a real impact on society is if we start to break down our silos and and make sure that we we are working across the various disciplines, and also. Um, you know, this is a great start to this wonderful relationship that I hope we'll have for many years. But by, by, by bringing us together and developing those relationships, it creates a certain level of trust and willingness to share. Um, you know, by sharing these ideas and innovations, it's going to stimulate, as other speakers said, further ideas. But we're also going to, I think, in my opinion, this is going to create some disruptive technologies. And so it will be important that there is sharing, but at the same time, giving the innovators an opportunity to take those technologies into a commercial state um, and really bring them into the hands of the users, whether that's industry, whether it's society, um, and, and the stakeholders that we're at will actually make use of those. So part of our work is really um, how do we discover these novel processes? How do we identify the technologies that we're going to need to address these challenges? How do we you know, deal with the fact that we have different environments, whether it's uh, you know, a physical environment or a cultural environment? We, we have a lot of work to do on the processing of materials and minerals side. Um, we, we can really look at sharing and recycling materials across the various countries rather than uh, just locally, as, as was noted that these are, this is a global issue. Um, and then once we have some very good solutions, I think that's the time to maybe regroup and say, okay, what is the intellectual property? How do we address that sufficiently? But I think if we start with the concept of open innovation, we're much more likely to have significant findings that would benefit multiple stakeholders and parties. And I know that that isn't often how um, academia approaches the problem. I know certainly in my office, as I'm sure in yours, we have tech transfer offices and there's all kinds of things in, in agreements that we write to protect intellectual property. But I think we have to take a different view on these global challenges and move away from that as our initial stance and really truly look at what benefits we can gain by collaborating and working openly um, on open innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Uh, I will change the question to Adam. I will say, well, if we work in an open innovation environment, how we could really join efforts to address this important challenge of sustainable manufacturing in the Americas? Sorry, same question basically is what Amelia had? How we can really join forces yeah. and then do well, I, work I think she, she covered most of the topics I had listed. First and foremost, I believe relationships are really key to getting things done. 
and that starts with the leadership of the organizations. And that's where Arturo has done so well in helping us build these relationships. And I think we have those relationships now and we can move to the next level. And that is to exercise our leadership abilities to try to encourage other people to adopt this cause, to be interested in what we can do collectively to help solve issues related to sustainable manufacturing in particular and to climate change more generally speaking. And as was mentioned, sharing information I think is critical, but I also think it's important that we really build communication channels that will allow us to communicate regularly in some detail to share both technical successes and technical setbacks so we don't waste time in areas where we don't have time to waste. And finally, I think the biggest commitment we can make is through investment. We shouldn't just look to outside entities to fund the research and development activities that need to take place to really make sufficient progress in this area. So each of us, each of us as a leader or manager in our organization has to recognize that we need to contribute. We need to put money behind our commitment, behind the leadership, behind the organizations that we establish to work together to really make progress. Eventually, the external funding will come, but we really have to invest now to make this organization in particular really work and start to work efficiently so we can attract that external funding. Thank you, Adam. Well, I will ask another question for you, Vladimir. Sorry. Sure, I, okay. I do have a couple of things to say on this one. I think. Okay, uh, so if you want, I, I will ask you the question and then you can... Of course, of course, piece, and then I can bend The other thing around. is that I know MIT has this philosophy, you know, that the research has to do a goodwill for the humanity. And you really did this as a strategy in, in the, uh, during the Rafael Reef, you know, presidency. Yeah. I would like you to answer the first question and also talk about, about this idea of how really knowledge in the, in, in, the, in the right hands and with the right transfer can really change the lives of people. I, I'll answer it maybe as a, if you think of it as a business, uh, universities, um, our job is to attract the best and the brightest people of the world to come and work with us, train with us, and then go out and make impact on their own. Result of it is that if I think of it selfishly, I need to figure out a way to be the most inspiring institution I can. And that is not about making money. It's about making impact. I need to ensure that everything we do is leading to impact in the world through two products. One product that we as universities do is we generate great knowledge. If our patents and if, uh, if our papers move the world and someone says that's a technology developed at the tech, at MIT, at elsewhere. That's what's gonna attract the next generation of students to come to us. A much more powerful product of universities are people. Yeah, I would like as a student to be able to say, I wanna be just like that guy who finished that school. He changed the world in the following way because that institution trained him or her to do an amazing thing. So. Saving the world? Yes. <laughs> that's the mission that I can get everyone excited about. And that's the mission that the world needs. So apply ourselves towards that mission and we will be developing impact. I will add though, to continue the intellectual property to, uh, uh, set of discussions we just had, is that I think it's really important to ask, you know, if I have a great idea and I do want to impact the world, what would it take to get there? And often the answer is uh, 10 years, and over $100 million. There has never been any technology that started from scratch and then required that time and that kind of investment, typically more, typically several hundred million. No company today can responsibly give me that money. Every company today, the ones that are traded, has a responsibility to their stockholders to make money. That's what the companies are about. So how do I support this brand new idea? It's gonna take 10 years, and the lifetime of a typical CEO in a typical US Fortune 500 company is six years. <laughs> they, don't, they don't need to look that far ahead for their own tenure. 
and their responsibilities to their stockholders. Next quarterly profit is much more important than what's going to happen five to ten years from now. So there's a tremendous mismatch between what the planet needs ten years from now for us to deliver and what the companies of today are by design of the system we live in are designed to responsibly do. So it's not the fault of the companies. Companies are doing exactly what they're meant to do. But we need to figure out something else, like how to make the bridge, bridge between our inventions and final million people holding them in their hands. And the best I've seen as an example of that are indeed the startup technologies, the companies that are meant to lose money for the first five to 10 years <laughs> before they can become real. I mean, you know, you can ask very simple questions like, well, you know, how come SpaceX reached space station before, before Boeing did? Well, they had a very different financial model. SpaceX was okay to invest a lot of money and not show quarterly profits for many years. That wouldn't be okay for Boeing CEO, right? And you can similarly name many other examples, but the point being that we need that startup land that is venture supported or corporate venture supported as they see a strategic opportunity down the line and are willing to lose the money on that investment knowing that there will be a transition afterwards. To launch those companies, well, the only value that a startup has, given that its impact is going to be five, ten years from now, is the intellectual property that it can license. If it cannot have the ownership of the intellectual property, it cannot raise the money. And if the intellectual property sits on a shelf for everyone else to use, I'm not sure who that everyone else will be, given that the present companies don't have the 10-year trajectory on average, typically. They have a one quarter trajectory or five year trajectory. So to enable these ideas to flourish, that's the only reason for having licensing of intellectual property. Intellectual property, by the way, at universities, doesn't make any money to the universities. It makes enough money to file next year's patents. 87% um, I think of universities who um, license intellectual property don't make any money uh, to actually close the gap on how much they lose in licensing, in uh, prosecuting the patents. So it's not about the money for universities, it's about the impact. And in order to deliver impact, well, the only vehicle that is very effective is that small companies and startup companies who take the idea. And, and they could make the difference, of course, you know. If, going back to the, we have been talking about the sustainable development goals. How you, and I'm going to ask a challenging question for you, all of you. How you connect advanced materials, sustainable development goals? If we do research in advanced materials, how we can really have an impact in the sustainable development goals? Amina. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's such a great question. And, and when I look at the, the goals, there's so many of them, I think, that um, this topic can impact. And, and let me start with, you know, some of the more, um, you know, apparent or obvious ones. So obviously, uh, you know, by addressing this topic, we're going to impact climate action, which is the, the 13th goal, and affordable and clean energy. And those are some of the more obvious ones. But when we do talk about uh, equity and, and poverty issues, we, we have this tremendous opportunity now, regardless of the discipline we come from, and my background is engineering, and I've been in this profession for a long time, but what is really exciting to see evolve in, in my discipline is, We've, we've moved away from a strictly um, you know, technical approach to really looking at a more holistic approach of what, how what we do impacts other disciplines, such as the environment, such as society. And so when we talk about these uh, problems, whether it's advanced manufacturing or sustainable materials, all of us have an opportunity to impact many of the, of these, uh, uh, the SDG, SDG goals. And uh, you know, I'm sure you're all very close to many of them, so I won't get into um, any more specifics. But when I think of advanced materials, I think of um, an opportunity to look at how we sustainably mine certain materials, how we sustainably um, you know, extract some of our critical minerals that we're going to need for manufacturing processes and how that relates to clean energy. And so we know that with clean energy, we're going to need um, more technologically advanced solutions. We're going to look at the environmental aspects 
of the technology we're developing. We're going to look at minerals that we need very much, and that's such an important aspect of advanced materials. Um, we've got a lot of work to do on the infrastructure and the grid side in order to make sure that we're, whatever we're producing is sustainable, and that's going to require a lot of knowledge in this in in this space. Um, we also really have to going back to um, what some of my colleagues have said is impact, and impact is such a an important concept for all of us that work at academic institutions. And I'm glad that. You know, my colleagues noted that intellectual property and, and exploitation of that isn't really something that we generate a lot of revenue from. It's really seen as getting our inventions out the door. So when we look at what we do in terms of the um, SDG goals, we, we have an opportunity to impact so many of them through our work. And some of it is definitely on the, uh, you know, the aspects of the technologies we're developing. But there's so much more impact we can do on some of the, the goals that are more relevant to our society. And so by looking at this topic through that lens, we're going to develop more holistic solutions that look at multiple disciplines in addressing these problems. And uh, you know, having this venue and this forum is such a great opportunity for us to start those conversations. Um, you know, As I said, I, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Tech uh, de Monterey in June, and, and I again thank you for Dr. Molina and his colleagues for hosting me. But I learned so much about what you're doing that I could not have learned otherwise. And so, with my colleagues here today who are on this panel, I really hope that through this um, institute we continue that relationship and visit each other and really see how we tailor this work to achieve our uh, these SDG goals. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Uh, Adam, you want to read well, the question? Yes. Uh, Thank you. I, I, I think we can set some very specific goals in areas uh, that would involve everything from energy, where we can look at how many or how much of uh, fossil fuels we are using to produce the demands for energy that we have. And not just that, but how what the emissions are looking like. We're working on one technology now with the U.S. Department of Energy that will eventually allow us to produce electricity for the grid from a fossil fuel with zero emissions. This is a, a closed loop process using supercritical carbon dioxide in the power cycle, and we can eventually do oxycombustion inside this closed loop and produce that electricity with, with no emissions. So I think looking at the emissions, looking at the, the materials we're using to develop and create energy, also recycling now is a huge issue. There are, are many statistics out there on this, but in the United States, at least, it's been estimated that only about 10% of the consumer waste products that we put in a consumer recycling bin are actually recycled. So the public is behind it. The public, the recycling mass has really increased, but how much of it is really being recycled is fairly disappointing. So we're looking at ways now through some fluidized bed pyrolysis processes, we're, we're able to recycle virtually 99% of the materials that a consumer might put in these bins. So I think looking at those statistics, how much are we really doing, not just are accomplishing and not just going through the motions and being supportive of, let's really d identify some specific metrics that are important. Thank you. I guess I would just add that uh, it's, the world is made of atoms, and uh, that is what the material Institute indeed will focus on. In many ways, there are solutions, for example, the ones, some of the ones I was presenting, um, are able to quickly deploy themselves only because already infrastructure is there. Agriculture is always the, already there, and if you just put an additive in the water that is sprayed on the plants, you'll be able to get the pesticides to stick better. Um, that means that as long as you can work into an existing ecosystem, economic ecosystem, you might be able to find a very quick ways to put some of the technologies in there. Hence, what is important is to always keep in mind what is the techno-economic analysis that also comes along with your technological advancement. It's great to have a technology, but unless you can manufacture it or unless it requires the following set of things very clearly defined, you can't really make a judgment of what truly can be the impact of it. So keeping in mind, 
uh, what is the techno-economics behind your next set of great scientific ideas is a key to actually attracting the industry to be our partners. It makes us much more responsible as academics, at least in the eyes of our business people that look at us and say, well, that sounds like an academic idea. And you can say, oh, no, no, no. Here is an actual uh, economic argument that one can make for this. Just be patient with me. Right. Translation of ideas into really impact and business, because that's where is the money, right? And that will we get the finance to do more research. So I would like to open the, uh, the panel to questions from the public. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Also, we are going to receive some questions from Steaming. I think that I see a hand over there. Is you can pass the microphone. Do we have a microphone? Can you use this? See? Alguien me ayuda? Hi, good afternoon. Um, I wanted to ask you guys how you approach cultural or political barriers, especially when you know governmental, government leaders are changing all the time and some of them don't agree with sustainable manufacturing and they spread that opinion around you know, the country and to other countries. Amina, do you want to answer first? Sure, I, I, that's just such a great question, and, and thank you for asking it. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Molina knows, because he's involved with us right now in a major federal uh, application that we're putting forward on energy and climate change. And uh, we're facing, you know, the fact that we have uh, a lot of support in Canada in this area. Having said that, I also live in a province um, where there is a concern about moving away from our traditional oil and gas um, sector because we have been, our economy has been largely based on that. So I'm facing that in a real way to try and balance our federal priorities with our provincial priorities. And there are ways to do that because it's important, I think, to consider all perspectives. And, and to your point, these governments do change over time, sometimes quite dramatically. And uh, the way we're addressing it actually is partly through these wonderful international partnerships like we have with Tech de Monterey, because we're able to develop solutions that um, are fit within different contexts, but are also adaptable. And as academics and researchers, we're here for the long term. Um, we, we know that these things take time and we know that we can't change course um, based on political sort of changes, otherwise we'll never create the, uh, the momentum that we need to solve these problems. And so I guess my answer to that is to ensure that what we're developing are solutions that um, consider the different perspectives. So in our case, we're looking at clean energy, not by simply abandoning hydrocarbon based sources, but looking at how we mitigate their impacts through CCUS and through direct air capture. And at the same time, uh, knowing that we have uh, net zero goals in 2030, but also in 2050. So we, we drive towards uh, those goals through different uh, methodologies. Some are more short term and some are more long term. So we're looking at developing all the clean technologies that we know will be required, but at the same time transitioning our existing technologies. And that includes transitioning our workforce because we also have to take care of people. And it's people that are at the heart of all of this. So ensuring that whatever we're developing is also in line with the skilling required of those that need to implement those solutions. And then the last thing I would say is um, we have long-term collaborative relationships with industry. And uh, Dr. Molina mentioned the importance of that, and I would echo that. Our relationships with industry, getting our work into their hands, getting it to the pilot stage and implemented is also how we deal with the fact that while different politics and governments may change, we have to continue to push on these things because they are longer term solutions. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, thank you for the question, first of all. It, it's, um, it's been challenging to be a, a CEO in the last few years, uh, not just because of the pandemic, 
but also because we are facing these sustainability issues. We've also had inflation in the United States, at least, that's been running rampant. Uh, we've had work from home issues. And then it's been complicated through the pandemic with things about conflicts on masks or vaccines. And so there's always there's plenty of opportunity to have strife or disagreements among our staff. And the way we try to manage that is as a science and engineering organization, first of all, we're a little different than the university. We are a nonprofit corporation, so I have no owners. We just have a mission statement. And so what we try to do is to be apolitical. In fact, we are, pro we are prohibited from contributing to political campaigns and such. So we stay apolitical as an organization. And we also insist upon respect. So in our workplace, we recognize that people may have different political beliefs or other ideas. And that's OK. What we try to work toward is an environment where everybody is treated with respect, no matter what their belief or position might be. And we generally just try to keep that kind of moderated so we don't have a, a lot of po political discord, discourse in the organization. As far as what technologies we choose to work on, what we try to do is to, to work on technologies and solutions that will have a net positive effect, not a net zero effect. So supporting somebody's idea for how to improve or solve a problem does not take away from somebody else's concept or idea of the way things are done. We try to demonstrate to all parties that we're working together to develop proactive solutions that will benefit all and that one is not wrong and one is not right to try to avoid that, that discourse. Thank you. That's a very insightful question. Any thoughts, Vladimir? I, you know, my colleagues have said it extremely well. Uh, great ideas persist, and the companies that we work with would choose to make business out of them. And most importantly, great people that we have a chance to train, they'll persist as well. And the governments will change, hopefully for the better. <laughs> we have time for one more question, please. Hello. Ah. Professor Bulovic, you've mentioned that there is this great mismatch between what's beneficial for stakeholders in many instances and for companies and what would be beneficial for the environment. Uh, and that also in order to promote these technological ideas, there is a need of this eco-technological analysis for it to work. Should we be also, should we be re-engineering our economies too so that these ideas are, have an easier time to get to markets and to well, make all of this process easier? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, you shouldn't get a business degree while you're studying your material science and, <laughs> and technology. Um, you should focus on material science and technology, but as a citizen of the world and someone who reads newspaper and wants to make judgment on what you heard about, you should always keep an open mind towards what are all the elements that play a role in making these particular ideas succeed or not. Technoeconomics is a simple way of thinking of it. And even if you're not a business person, you can do some very quick back of the envelope, as we would say, analysis that says, well, this will take this much, this will take this much. Companies that will take this need to be of this size. Is there anyone like that to actually take this idea? Um, there is a mismatch. That doesn't mean that it's unsurpassable. Uh, I think these mismatches we need to be aware of. The reason why I'm talking about them, and yet we are all in a room trying to figure out what is it, is so that we have a perfect appreciation of each other's motivations and figure out how can I help you so that despite the fact you need to meet a quarterly earning report, I can actually give you something that, yeah, it won't make you money, but it will give you value that your stakeholders, your investors will say, oh, yes. We need to go towards that. That is what we as academics need to keep in mind. It's not all of us sitting on our own and whatever happens, happens. I better understand the businesses really, really well. I better understand the government really, really well and know that my strength is neither end of those two areas. My strength is in making the next grand ideas and open them in discussion so they do the same with me. They want to understand my motivations and figure out how can they support me knowing that their primary responsibility is towards their own constituencies. So that is all I was trying to emphasize. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you have any questions from the uh, uh, 
digital platforms. I don't receive any. But you, if we have time for one more question, really. Over there. Hi. Uh, I hope my question is not very specific, but I'll, I'll just give it a shot. It's about the manufacturing of bioproducts. So uh, we normally associate the products that have the word bio on it as eco-friendly manufacturing products, but sometimes it's not the truth. So the material itself, it might look ideal, biodegradable or whatever, the product itself, but um, producing great batches of these uh, materials, either uh, produced from microorganisms or things like that, they might generate tons of emissions, like using microorganisms as a source of material creates a great amount of emissions and solvents are created as well in the process. So um, those kind of manufacturing processes are not often um, supported when you are trying to look for, I don't know, investment or whatever. So we go back to the same solutions, which is not using microorganisms to use or to create those materials. And as a future professional in biotechnologies, I'm really concerned about how or what is, what is the projection for this kind of manufacturing processes? Do you, do you see uh, just hope on them? Or are we just going back and forth for the same solutions? Yeah, uh, I, can, I can try to give you a quick answer to that. So uh, oil and coal are bioproducts. <laughs> they are. They're made from plants and animals, right? Um, so what is important to highlight is that use of any material can have a deleterious effect on the planet. And studying the life cycle of the product often can re make you recognize those additional externalities, things that you weren't focusing on. We often think about product meets a particular need, but how is it made? What are the ores it came from? What is its end of life gonna look like? Is it gonna be 10% recycled, or is it gonna be recycled in some other way? That is what we refer to as a life cycle uh, from you know, the ore to the final dump site. Uh, understanding that, doing that for whatever technology you're trying to advance, is really the key to making sure that we are stewarding the planet uh, properly. Um, Amina, any thoughts about it? Bio um, pro bioprocess production yeah, systems? Thank you. <laughs> it's a very good question. And, and when, when I was listening, I was thinking about um, leveraging artificial intelligence in this space. Um, we talk a lot about uh, smart agriculture, or if you want to call it intelligent uh, agriculture, intelligent manufacturing. We, and, and of course, there's so much work going on in biomanufacturing of health, um, you know, cell-based therapies, small molecule drug development, things to help us deal with, uh, you know, future, hopefully not any near future pandemics, but pandemics. And then the agriculture industry is, is such a, an important aspect when we talk about these things. And while I don't have a, a, a concrete answer for you, and I, I, I do, I think it's a huge area of research, I, I can't help but think that our, leveraging some of our smart technologies to automate things um, and minimize some of these impacts um, is really something that we have, have started to take our artificial intelligence techniques and apply them in so many different disciplines. And I see this as a, a huge potential for how we might um, learn about what are the impacts of, of these processes, but collect significant amounts of data to allow us to get much smarter at uh, determining how to improve these processes and minimize uh, the impacts on the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Adam, any? Just some quick comments. Uh, I, I really believe that the speed of advancement right now in bioengineering and biochemistry is so fast we are learning practically every day more about how we can do things with bioprocesses. So our ability to image and to be able to know how genes actually cause the things to happen that they do and how we can help 
program those genes and how we can use the information we have about the actual visualization and shape uh, so we have more than just the chemistry of the genomics. I think that we're going to see a significant increase in bioprocesses in manufacturing in the future. Good degree pick. So you will have a lot of work. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> well, uh, I think we're at the final of this uh, panel. Uh, any thoughts in one word? How you see our relationship? In one word? Fantastico. Uh. <laughs> Avina? Um, you know, the word collaboration comes to mind. This is a start, I hope, of, of many years of future collaboration. Great. I, th I think we just started. Uh, I, I think what we have found is every year is yet another achievement, and every year feels like we just started. There is so much more to do, and we are better doing it together. Yeah. Together for together for science and for solutions. Thank you very much for the panel.